Welcome. Thank you all for your patience, and thank you so much for coming inside on this beautiful warm day to talk about um, Venezuela in crisis, its origins, impacts, and possible futures. Um, let me just introduce myself really briefly. I'm Victoria Langland. I'm the new director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at the International Institute. And before I introduce our panelists, I just wanted to give you all a, a very brief description of what this event is and what we're hoping to accomplish, um, just so that you kind of have a sense of the context of where we came from. Um, the International Institute periodically hosts these kind of round table discussions on current events. These are opportunities to bring t together scholars from different disciplines and different perspectives to share their views on matters of pressing concern for the rest of us. They approached me a couple weeks ago with their desire to host something on the current crisis in Venezuela and asked if I could help them identify people with important insights to share. And I thought this was so important and so pressing. Um, and as a Brazilian, it's something I too was very deeply curious about and not as well informed enough about as I'd like to be. Um, the news coming out of Venezuela in the last several years has, as you all know, has been really dire, right? We hear of shortages of food, of medicine and supplies. We hear about extremely high inflation. We hear about several different waves of protest-related violence, um, of deep political divisions within Venezuela, and of multiple charges that the Venezuelan government is impacting and, and damaging democratic institutions. Yet for most of us, and I include myself very clearly here, it can be really challenging to try to piece together the complexities not only of just what is transpiring, but even more difficult to make sense of why. Um, first, because it is complex, right? There's a lot going on, but also because Venezuela has served as a particularly potent symbolic boogeyman in the United States for various contingents of U.S. political actors. Um, and so the, 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 the news that we hear is often skewed through a variety of different lenses. And along these same lines, it's often very personalized um, in sometimes quite buffoonish and decidedly unhelpful ways, where first Chavez and now Maduro are lampooned or sometimes lionized in ways that are made to stand in for a host of other issues. And so it can be harder for us to hear through all of that noise and kind of get a, bit, a better grasp of what is going on on the ground. So most importantly, what I think that many of us would like to get closer to understanding are the questions of what is at stake in Venezuela right now, for whom, and what are the broader implications of these recent developments there. So for me, that's kind of the, the bigger context um, we're really fortunate to have three wonderfully talented people here who are going to help us kind of think through this together. And what we've done on our end is we've given them either very wide freedom or perhaps painfully little guidance <laughs> in terms of structuring their comments. We basically said, whatever you think is most important to bring to the table, that's what we'd like to hear. We've also given them very little time. They've got 15 minutes tops. And my hope really is that each person will bring what they think is important and then collectively through both their initial comments and through your questions, all of us together will come to a better understanding of this moment of what it means for Venezuela and for the world. So I'm really going to be calling on all of you to kind of take this conversation to the next, the next step as we go, for, as we go forward. Um, so let me introduce the panelists in the order in which they'll be speaking. Um, to immediately to my right is Professor Daniel Levine, who is a professor of political scientist, uh, excuse me, a professor of political science emeritus from here, from the University of Michigan. Professor Levine has been studying Latin America for over 50 years, and he's published widely on the region, from his first book, The Conflict, Conflict and Political Change in Venezuela, from 1973, to his latest book, Politics, Religion, and Society in Latin America, which came out in 2012, and many, many publications in between. Um, seated next to him is Nilo Coret, an assistant professor of Spanish here at the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures. Uh, he works on Latin American cinema and popular culture. He's finishing one book on film comedies, and he's starting another on documentary film practice and circulation in the global south. Among other works, Professor Corday is the author of an article called The Revolution Was Over-Televised, Reconstructing the Venezuelan Media Coup of 11 April 2002, which came out in Social Identities. And then finally, Skyping in from Sydney, Australia at 7 o'clock in the morning. Can we say hooray for <laughs> Skyping in at 7? And originally it was going to be 6 o'clock, but they just changed times. So um, she's like on the other side of the 6 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning divide. Um, professor Sujata Fernandez, who is a professor of political economy and sociology at the University of Sydney. Professor Fernandez is the author of numerous books and articles, including Who Can Stop the Drums, Urban Social Movements in Chavez's Venezuela, which came out with Duke University Press in 2010, and most recently, hot off the presses, a book I would highly recommend, um, Curated Stories, The Uses and Misuses of Storytelling, which came out in 2017 from Oxford University Press and takes this really provocative look at the, at the kind of 
push and impetus to creating and helping people narrate their stories and ways in which that can mobilize or demobilize different, different groups. Um, and there's one particular chapter on the Mission Cultura project in Venezuela. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Levine, and I'll sit down and take, uh, take notes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, although I moved to Chicago. Recording to Chicago. has started. I sh what's that? What's that? Morning has started? That's nice. Although I moved to Chicago after retiring from the university, it's always a pleasure to come back to Ann Arbor. I'm very grateful for the invitation and the opportunity to, to participate here. I have a prepared text that's going to be published later this month in LASA Forum, which is a um, Journal of the Latin American Studies Association. It's only 1,800 words, and I'll share it later if anyone wants. Before I turn to that text, I have a couple of introductory remarks. First, while coming here on the train, I realized that it's now more than 50 years since I first arrived in Venezuela as a graduate student going to do a PhD thesis. So I've been involved with Venezuela for about two-thirds of my life. I mentioned this to underscore that for me, Venezuela is much more than a passing academic interest a case in point of this or that policy or theoretical issue. I have a strong attachment to the country. I have many friends there. I really care about what happens to, to the country. As my friend, the late Janet Kelly, said to me, Venezuela's family. Second, when I think about the changes I've seen in all those years, I'm struck by the utter turnabout that confronts us now. What I found in the late 60s was a country coming out of a period of guerrilla war, a country with high economic, social, and geographic mobility, a country that was a magnet for immigrants, with widespread optimism about the future, powerful political parties, a, a seemingly tame military, constructing a sturdy democracy. The reverse is true now. Political parties are dead. Political institutions are gutted. What was optimism and upward mobility have been replaced by their opposites. Public health and public services have cratered, while violence and violent death have risen. From a place to which immigrants came, it's become a place from which people flee. There's economic decay, which I have statistics on if anyone wants data. as the highest inflation rate in the world. It is a tragedy, and this tragedy is not the result of some natural disaster. It's not from some combination of earthquake and hurricane. It is a self-inflicted wound, the product of years of bad economics and bad politics. So that's my story. My paper is called The Authoritarian Gambit. And basically, I argue that Venezuela is in the middle of a protracted bitter, often violent, and sometimes deadly struggle to determine what kind of society and what kind of government we'll have and what kind of hope, what kind of future Venezuelans can hope for. It's too early to know how this is going to turn out or how it's going to end up or what the process is going to be like, but it's not too early to know, <coughs> excuse me, what the regime and opposition want to identify the tools with which they work and to be clear about what they hope for and what they fear. They fear one another, I should say. The regime wants, above all, to stay in power. Its principal leaders and enablers, the army, the National Guard, the police and political police and paramilitaries, fear a loss of power, which would limit their access to goods and funds, make them vulnerable to legal and political processes, for example, for violation of human rights, corruption, or drug trafficking. As for tools, this is an evolving process. President Maduro has exercised full control of the executive branch of government, including institutions that monitor and control elections. He's relied on a wholly compliant judiciary, and he's counted on a range of security, what I like to call insecurity forces, that have played an active role in harassment and repression. What the regime no longer enjoys is popular support, the popular support that carried Hugo Chavez to a series of electoral victories, the last of which when he was clearly dying of cancer. After Chavez's death in early 2013, Maduro, who was his designated successor, was elected president by a tiny, a really tiny and contested margin. Since that time, the regime has lost successive elections at the local and regional level and lost control of the National Assembly, where the opposition gained an absolute majority in December 2015. What is the regime to do when electoral success becomes questionable and elections are no longer a reliable source of power and legitimation? The first step is to disqualify opposing candidates on charges of corruption or incitation to violence or failure to carry out their duties. 
If opposition candidates win anyway, a second step is to disqualify them, remove them from office. This has been the case of numerous mayors and of some deputies. When the assembly passes laws, a further step has been to have the courts disqualify them. Numerous laws were declared unconstitutional, including laws of amnesty and laws providing for land titling. If the problem persists, the next to final resort is to have the courts declare the assembly in rebellion and try to shut it down. This is what sparked the massive protests that began in early 2017. The Bolivarian Constitution of 1999 provides an elaborate mechanism for removing the president from office through a recall petition. What to do if the opposition gathers the required signatures and looks likely to force a recall election? The first response, which was used by Chavez when he faced a recall vote in 2004, is to engage in a series of delays, sequential changes of the rules, while strengthening the regime's position with economic benefits, with handing out stuff to people. But the current economic situation is so bad, and the government's popularity is so low, every study confirms this, that these do not appear sufficient. So what to do? The answer is that if all else fails, just cancel the elections indefinitely, which is what the government did. That at that point, they moved decisively away from democratic politics. With electoral means off the table and the very existence of the National Assembly threatened, ordinary political means lack validity, and the opposition turned to massive, continuous public protests and demonstrations and civic strikes. Faced with such tools, what does the regime do? Their choice, first choice is repression and intimidation, mass arrests of activists who are tried in military courts, arrests of political prisoners in the middle of the night, and violent active harassment of demonstrators and opposition figures. Uh, Foro Penal, which is a local um, hum human rights uh, organization, estimates about 700 political prisoners now. Some people like to say, well, there's violence from all sides, but I would like to insist to you that this is not the case. The overwhelming weight of violence, the overwhelming control and use of the means of violence lies in the hands of the regime, aided by paramilitary groups, official forces like the army, the police, the National Guard, and the political police. They deploy considerable force every day against members of the, of the opposition and against manifestations. Now, if violence is not enough, the next step given the opposition's use of the Constitution to legitimate its actions, has been just to scrap the Constitution and start again. This is the process of electing a, a, a national constituent assembly. The vote was held on July 30th. Installation was right after that. This is not an ordinary election. Candidates were pre-selected by the regime. No opposing views were represented. Moreover, in contrast to the constituent assembly that launched the Chavez period, there was no referendum to decide whether or not such an assembly should be elected in the first place. This is an assembly opposed from above, imposed from above, designed to create a fortified and armored authoritarian system. It's important to realize that a constituent assembly is a unique kind of legislature with no preset limits whatsoever. It is, the, it is how do you, I'm thinking in Spanish here. <laughs> it's a place where laws are originated. So no law really constrains what it does. And it's empowered to abolish all existing institutions, remove all existing officials, and start from scratch. They could declare the national language Swedish if they wanted. They haven't done that. Uh, so they began in exactly this way, asserting their authority, disqualifying or ousting oppo opponents, setting up a so-called truth commission. They've, done all, they've proceeded exactly like that to fortify the regime. So if all these are the goals and tools of the regime, what about the opposition? The short-term goals of the opposition remain to remove the president by legal and constitutional means, to hold new elections, free political prisoners, and restart the economy by loosening controls and opening, reopening international ties. Venezuela is very isolated economically in the international world, and the economic statistics are just uh, awful. The GDP has dropped 37 percent in the last four years. The real minimum wage is down 87 uh, percent. You name it. It's down. The only indices that have gone up are disease, violence, and unemployment. So they want to remove, they want to restart the economy, and all this has been laid out in legislation regularly swatted away by the Supreme Court. Um, and um, so how this contest will work out is difficult to predict. I really don't know. Anyone who says they know for sure doesn't really know, right? For the regime, the choice, to me, the choice for the regime is clear. They have to double down on authoritarian rule or they risk losing everything. And the Constituent Assembly is a vehicle for doing that. It's hard to know exactly what they'll come up with, but assert control of all institutions, continue to provide for elections, but with severe control and access, 
participation venues and candidates. I expect tightened control over media information, freedom of movement and association, crackdown on independent social movements, particularly those that monitor events like Foro Penal or Sumate, there's a variety of these, shut down external funding of such groups, accelerate repression and imprisonment. Uh, the real question is, if this is the authoritarian gambit, which is what I describe it as, will it work? Right? I don't know. Uh, similar efforts to stabilize authoritarian rule have worked, sometimes for a long time. Usually they last a long time after war, but they face a few great perils. Regimes of this kind face a few great perils. First of all, free elections, including referenda, are very dangerous. There are three cases in point in Latin America, the referendum in Nicaragua, in the election in Nicaragua in 1990, where the Sandinistas were defeated, and the referendum in Chile, where Pinochet uh, was defeated, and a referendum in Uruguay in 1980, which was also defeated. So we can expect elections to be tightly controlled. There'll be a test of it this month. Uh, sustained inter op internal opposition threatens to raise the cost of control to an excessive level, but I expect more repression. Continued accelerated economic decay will further outmigration. There are more than two million Venezuelans living in exile right now, and not just rich people. That's a complete myth. Uh, we can expect escalating violence, serial defections from the ruling coalition, military officers, public officials, and I imagine these can be contained for a while. So I expect the regime basically to double down on what it's already doing and to try to, their economic situation is very difficult. I'm not an economist, but they, for whatever reason, they've decided to service their external debt, which is enormous, regardless. So that's going to become harder and harder to do. Um, the options for the opposition are above all to sustain, maintain its unity, which is very difficult because it's a coalition, to sustain a public presence, to avoid provocations, and to um, coordinate support. As I mentioned, Venezuela is very isolated politically and economically. Numerous governments and transnational groups, Mercosur, the European Union, the UN, the Vatican, have condemned the destruction of democracy, have declined to represent, to recognize the constituent assembly. The foreign ministers and representatives of Argen Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Guatem and Paraguay, issued a so-called Declaration of Lima this past summer, stating exactly that. The OAS has been particularly forward under its new Secretary General in bringing the issue of Venezuelan democracy to the fore. International carriers have cut service. Trade is also likely to suffer, through uh, which will further damage the capacity of the regime to provide for basic needs. The result is further damage to the well-being of everybody. So I think this is going to be a rough and costly and violent ride. And I threw in a phrase in my written text, which is, so buckle up. It's going to be even worse than it looks now. Now, support, this is, I'm coming to the end. Uh, supporters of the regime argue that the troubles of Venezuela all stem from an economic war against the country being waged by imperialism. This story rings really hollow to anyone who looks at the facts, including government statistics. The only indices that have consistently gone up in the fast, past five years are inflation, which is the highest in the world, Deaths by violence, also the highest in the world. Outmigration, I mentioned that. Infectious diseases have returned, which are unknown in 50 years. Malaria, cholera, dengue fever, chikungunya. This is a public health issue. Uh, essential services, from transport to electricity to potable water, not to mention the availability of food and medicine, which are scarce of all, but collapsed. The regular repetition of the claim that it is somebody else's fault reminds me of Groucho Marx. Groucho Marx has a famous line in the movie Duck Soup. I don't know if you've been watching Groucho Marx, but I do. And his character, his central character, Rufus T. Firefly, is, present, is trying to convince something, some people of something totally absurd. And they're resisting. And Rufus T. Firefly says, quote, are you going to believe me or are you going to believe your lion eyes? So for me, I prefer to believe my eyes. I believe in facts, what we can see with our eyes, and the tools of social and political analysis, and I think the facts are as I outlined them. It's a struggle between a regime desperate to hold on to power and working to consolidate a more secure and lasting authoritarianism and an opposition hoping to reopen the country. I tell you truly that for me, what's going on in Venezuela is a tragedy and a crime. The news cycle has moved on. We can't find Venezuela much in the press anymore. Well, if you read the Spanish press, it's better, 
but the destruction of democracy and the devastation of the well-being of Venezuelans needs to be noticed and understood and condemned. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Tori and Laura for inviting me and for uh, helping me with my tech. Um, I am I, I'm really thrilled to be here with Daniel and with uh, Sujata. I am not nearly as deserve, I'm not nearly the expert that they are. Uh, I um, thanks. Um, yeah, the, not having a lot of, uh, and, oh, and, and the International Institute and the Center for Latin American Caribbean Studies, yes, so just <laughs> want to make sure I get everybody in that I want to thank. And um, for me, um, I come at this as somebody uh, who is, uh, was raised in Venezuela and came, to Venezuela and came to the U.S. mostly for university and for post-university work. I'm one of these two million people living out of the country. And um, as Tori mentioned, I worked on and I kind of decided to look at uh, Venezuela mostly through the 2002 media coup. And so what I'm going to discuss here today is mostly an expansion on that or looking beyond that. Uh, and, um, and so I'm hoping that for those who aren't as familiar with Venezuela, this is sort of an introduction to the mediascape in Venezuela. Um, and um, for me, though, it almost also becomes an index or it becomes a way to kind of let you all know how somebody that lives outside the country tries to keep up with what's happening inside the country and how that's kind of a challenge. Um, and so at, for, as part of the roundtable and as part of the conversation, I very much invite you to think about how you learn about Venezuela um, and, uh, if you, and, and uh, how you get information about Venezuela, um, where you get your information, uh, and how, in a sense, the splintering of the mediascape poses a certain kind of challenge, both for people who have family still living there or people who are trying to study it, like I am. Um, as uh, Also, uh, a lot of the kind of phenomena that are happening in Venezuela require us to sort of recast a lot of the ways we think about TV and media uh, through different lenses. And that's also something that's kind of interesting to me. And so I'm hopeful that this will tease out or work through some of these things. Again, this may be incredibly familiar for those who are from Venezuela. And I'm sorry if I bore you with this kind of like history 101 of some of Venezuela's media uh, phenomena. Um, but for the most part, um, Venezuela was actually one of the first countries to get TV, uh, believe it or not. Uh, back when it was 50 years, I did not uh, 50, I didn't live in the, I'm not that old. I'm so old. Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, but, um, but it mostly, I mean, for the longest time, though, how, it, it, TV and it, the origins of TV are very much about TV as public resource. Venezuela had a slightly different story to its television, uh, mostly because it was from, almost from the get-go, it was an oligopoly. Um, it was mostly privately run with RCTV Radio Caracas Televisión, founded in 53, eh, Venezolana Televisión in 64, and that eventually becomes the only public network, and we'll talk about that in a second. Venevisión in 61, Televen eventually in the 80s, and Globovisión in, in the early 90s. Um, as I said, Venezolana Televisión began as a private network, but it eventually became a public network. And so it's important to understand that how, and it's, this is sort of the way TV used to work, right? Like there were, in the States, right, we had three networks, and we had four networks, and now we have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of networks. But understanding the ways that this mediascape was dominated by four private enterprises is really important to understanding what happens in 2002 with the coup. And uh, th that really sort of sets off a big initiative under Chavismo of trying to change how media works. Media really does become a battlefield. And so it's, I find that it's a really useful way to tell the story of Venezuela, mostly because it sort of reduces the actors and it sort of makes us focus on, uh, you know, a couple of different players. Uh, and what literally happens with the 2002 coup is that um, pr private media sort of flexes its muscles. It, in, it, I don't want to say that it necessarily incites people to go out in the streets, but it's, it's a, it, it, there are all these public service announcements that get broadcast Try, uh, fanning the flames of, of, uh, of a strike that's happening in 2002 and eventually shuts down the one public network. Uh, when the public network is shut down, there are basically no more visible images of the president and the official government. And so the only people that are on screen speaking are people that are with this opposition and with this very short-lived regime under this coup. And so this is why it's called this media coup. This is why the int uh, it, it really is. It, 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 you have to sort of think like uh, this is a president. Uh, this is a presidency that was 
only really knocked down on screen. Okay, and that's how most of these people live it. And so I want to just, I'm going to play a couple of these like PSAs from 2002, which I find are absolutely fine. Recargado tus pilas, vamos todos juntos a las seis de la tarde a la gran marcha de las antorchas. Puntos de salida. Plaza Las Américas. Distribuidor Los Ruices. Distribuidor Santa Fe. Distribuidor Altamira. Elevado de Bellomonte. Plaza Alfredo Sadel en Las Mercedes. Plaza La Candelaria. Para llegar a la Plaza de la Meritocracia en Chuao, lleva tus linternas y velas para la Gran Fogata. Este lunes, con tus pilas bien cargadas, nuevamente toma tus calles. Coordinadora Democrática. I'm just going to show the very first one because I want to compare, I want to point out how a march, how a protest is being called. You know, you're being called to protest and start in different places and then meet in one big plaza in 2002 and how that's going to change 15 years later, okay? So this April coup, you basically get Venevisión, uh, RCTV, Globovisión, Televen, replacing regular programming with, anti, with these anti-Chavez speeches and eventually Venezolana being shut down, okay? Um, and the coup fails for lots of different reasons. We can go into that in the Q&A if you like, but what's fascinating to get out of this, is what happens after the coup. And three main things happen after the coup. And this is what I'm going to try to start charting. One thing is after the failure of the coup, Chavez basically decided to, okay, I'm going to try to kind of undo or at least work against this media hegemony. Uh, and this takes some negative turns. It also takes some kind of positive or what look on the surface as constructive turns. And so I, I want to try to characterize this fairly. So he shuttered uh, some of these private outlets and expanded state media exponentially. Perhaps most, most famously, in 2007, he actually revoked the, public, the, the license of RCTV, which was a leading anti-government broadcaster at the time. It is since now, it's now on cable and on satellite television. But at the time, uh, it became, uh, it was pretty much shuttered, set off a massive series of protests in 2007, and other networks decided to dial back their dissent in their coverage to avoid having their licenses revoked for technical and administrative reasons. And so um, this eventually even led, at the time, there were 34 different radio stations closed as late as 2009. And, to, and the two most popular network channels, uh, Venevisión and Televen, uh, which, were, which are privately owned, have toned down their criticism of the government over the past several years. Um, and Globovisión eventually fell into line after its uh, leader was put in prison <laughs> and, and was arrested. And so now there's this sense of uh, people, people in the, in, in the officialist people are still against them. The opposition now kind of calls for them as cowards and as complices to the regime. So that's one thing that happens. You start getting this attack on this oligopoly. At the same time, there's a big investment in community organizing and in alternative media outlets. So you get this proliferation of new channels, new networks, new programming on cable, satellite, and on and in public broadcast. So you get TVs, which is a great TVs. I, I, somewhere down here, I'm sorry. Uh, th there it is, the third one up on the top. TVs, which they, they really do good bra branding, right? As in, you see yourself, TVs. Uh, Vive TV, you have Conciencia TV, uh, Meridiano, Anteves, there's C-SPAN. So you get this proliferation of community and regional network television programming. Um, the most notorious, obviously, is Telesur, which is right here. I'm sorry, I don't have a laser pointer, but you can, Telesur, which, be, which was founded in 2005 to basically sort of combat CNN in Espanol and provide 24-hour news coverage and cultural programming in the entire Latin American region. And it's owned and paid for by several countries, Venezuela, Argentina, although Macri has since pulled out, Cuba, Uruguay, Bolivia, Nicaragua. Um, and um, the founder of Telesur was originally somebody from Uruguay who eventually who stepped down when he talked about how Telesur never really achieved Latin Americanization and continued to be mostly Venezuelan. And finally, in pra oh, and then Katia Tebe is a very fascinating example of trying to empower communities that are in popular sectors or in poor neighborhoods to make their own television. Um, and finally, there is censorship, uh, which is coded or which is spoken about under this ley de responsabilidad social en radio televisión, this ley of social responsibility in television and broadcasting, which in the press, which in opposition press became known as the gag law, la ley mordaza. Um, and the 2004 passage of this law, the government won wide latitude to censor media in order to, quote, promote social justice and further the development of the citizenry, democracy, peace, human rights, education, culture, public health, and the nation's social and economic development. And it was expanded to include the internet and social media. 
uh, in such a way that it could establish mechanisms to restrict without delay the dissemination of messages. And violators would be fined up to $3,000 or 10% of their annual income and face service suspension. Um, journalists uh, found themselves quite restricted, not just in terms of what they could say, but whether they could leave the country. Um, and so um, this is all. This all happens post coup, and mostly uh, around 2007 to 2011. Chavez passes away in 2013, and with that, you get a, a, a you get Maduro, and you get a renewed se a series of protests. And I want to use 2014 protests from February. Uh, they were from February to April to kind of start discussing how protesting and looks different and how it uses media differently. Okay, so in 2014, you get a new series of protests that start in Medi, that start in the west of the country, which has always part of been politically restive. And what's fascinating about it is that it becomes hashtag dos uh, 12, February 12th. And you start seeing this use of hashtags, and you start seeing that mobilization no longer happens on, these, on television. It all mostly happens through Twitter, and Instagram, and WhatsApp. And so trying to keep track of what is happening in Venezuela when it's no longer news media, and when it is no longer television, poses a really interesting dilemma um, and uh, for, for an investigator uh, and for somebody living abroad trying to follow what's happening at home. Um, and so what you start seeing is uh, about a demonstrations which broke out in La Universidad de Los Andes in Táchira and in Mérida gathered to protest, uh, and the incident highlighted concerns about growing insecurity and crime under Maduro, but the protest movement uh, grew over several months to include grievances ranging from rising inflation to chronic food shortages, and I want to talk more about 2014 mostly because I've documented it. 2017, I've got a couple of images and I can talk a little bit about what happened recently, but it's you know, very recent, and I know I'm running out of time, and I'm sorry. Uh, so um, what, you, what you start seeing, I think I'm just going to go off this a bit. You, what you start seeing is the uses of Twitter to start kind of fact-checking, to start documenting people that have been disappeared or arrested. So these are cellulas, or national ID numbers, sort of the equivalent of social security numbers. Uh, months later, these protests last for several months. It's kind of interesting because what ends up happening is it coincides with uh, Carnival, it coincides with Semana Santa, and you start getting a lot of uh, uh, people trying to lobby for, don't go on vacation, stay protesting, please. Venezuelans are notorious for always protesting on like the Friday so they can take the long weekend. Uh, and so it, this happens over a, 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 a quite a bit of time. Um, oh, uh, and so you start seeing people just, okay, these are marches, and this is the only graphic image, and I apologize, and it gets way more graphic. So people start, in a sense, documenting their own and other people's uh, injuries, deaths, and it, and it, and it uh, with, with both photographic and video evidence. You start seeing people trying to fact check and to, in a sense, keep tabs on what the government is doing. Uh, so the government calls for people, for, the, for an officialist protest, it requires uh, government workers to go to a protest. Uh, you start seeing claims that the uh, Cantere, which is the, the phone company that provides internet access for most people, which was nationalized post-coup, uh, is, slowing, is, is slowing people's internet access. You start seeing people trying to verify that any kind of uh, reporting, any kind of photographic evidence being provided by the government by, through officialist media has been doctored. Or So they claim that they have this many people, but really this image is actually from 2009. Uh, you see, uh, th th this image is actually from 2013. Uh, and, you, and you get anonymous style hacking on Twitter, okay? Um, and what's interesting is obviously what happened or what changed. Not only did you see the splinter, this fa the fact that they don't have access to TV, they also, act, I should point out, don't have access to newspapers in the same way because they ran out of print, like they ran out of paper. So newspapers are actually also pretty much defunct. Be, uh, you know, they're, there's like one, they're one page with tiny little font, it's almost like reading a Bible because they ran out of print paper to print newspapers. So you start getting um, tactics that are borrowed from the Arab Spring, which happened in 2011, and Occupy, and the American Occupy movements. So this is, about, this is a, a, a sign in one of these protests that, talks, that compares the Venezuelan protest explicitly to the Arab Spring. And so you start getting, uh, both on Twitter and on Instagram, people trying to forward both news information, news items, what is happening in Venezuela, as well as how to prepare, how to avoid tear gas, how to build a, a blockade, uh, 
And then you start getting these convocation smart chips. If we remember the earlier TV PSA, now you start getting this is where we're going to start, this is where we're going to meet, and it also allows for visibility that is beyond just Caracas. You start getting regional visibility through these media. Um, and then for people who stay home, there are, you, you start getting these instructions about opening your Wi-Fi. This is also borrowed from the Arab Spring. Uh, people that are offering services, medical services, therapy services, uh, car problems, mechanics who are willing to, this is all on Instagram. You start noticing people that are, uh, give you, for me, one of the most interesting things that's happening is that people start, um, there starts to become this kind of convention of how to be a citizen reporter. So you need to put, you need to timestamp. You need to use a particular kind of hashtag. You start seeing people, this image is the wrong image. You need to make sure to timestamp your image and verify your image with Google Images. So there are instructions about how to verify your image so that you can timestamp your image correctly and not mislead people. Do not retweet something. Check, verify your news item is accurate before retweeting it. Um, and so you start seeing Twitter and Instagram be really taking off. More recently, obviously, you start getting WhatsApp, Instagram, and Twitter being used not just for protests, okay, this is after 2014, but also for uh, civic engagement for neighborhood watches. We're going to use WhatsApp groups for neighborhood watches. We're going to use WhatsApp for rationing water, rationing power, announcing when items that are food items that are scarce are in the neighborhood. You start getting WhatsApp being used to ship things from overseas. I've used WhatsApp. I've used this. That's why I'm mentioning it. Um, and you start getting Instagram for people who are both seeking medication uh, as well as selling medication. Um, so this is from 2017, and so in 2017, you just you you start. Uh, one of the interesting things is now you start getting Facebook Live, uh, Snapchat, and you start getting Periscope. And I I end with this, or I have one of these last ones because this is my building, in the background, and this is where I live. Um, Which one? Or where the, the this building. Right here. Uh, so this is like Santa Fe, that building that's to the left. And so um, I kind of wanted to end with this personal note of how uncanny it is to see where you grew up, where you live as battlefield, um, and uh, how living over, oh, sorry, I want to just briefly go back to this. And yeah, and so end on, end on that personal note of, yes, uh, media has changed extensively. I'm gonna, I can go into a little bit why I say that sort of it's through the looking glass or a lot of the things that we associate, let's say, with radical or leftist politics ends up getting co-opted or changed or, you know, kind of has a totally different valence in the current Venezuelan media scape. But I think I'll end it with that. All right. Thanks. Yes, I can hear you. Should I go ahead? Okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, thanks to Tori and Laura and to the International Institute and to my fellow panelists. Um, yes, it is uh, very early here in the morning on the other side of the world. So greetings from Sydney, Australia. Uh, so I wanted to just um, give a little bit of, uh, you know, part of what this panel is looking at is, is origins, and I wanted to talk a little bit about what I see as the origins of the current crisis. Um, and even going before the, the Chavez era to think about um, the, uh, the, the longer history of, of Venezuela, um, for instance, uh, the period of the 1980s, the, the massive debt crisis that hit Venezuela in the 1980s, and then the free market policies that began to be employed, not as much as in other places, but the, the sort of neoliberal free market policies of privatization and deregulation, all of these policies that were employed um, during the period of the 90s kind of set the stage for uh, the rise of Chavismo and 
um, those policies which uh, gutted public institutions, which created large amounts of unemployment, um, which uh, really, as in other places in the world, cut back the public welfare sector, um, caused a massive increase in inequality and caused a massive increase in um, the barrio and the poor rural populations of Venezuela. Um, and this is something that my book, Who Can Stop the Drums, looks at, is that rise of, um, of, of inequality in Venezuela in that period of the 90s and, um, and also the rise of community-based politics. Now, this is not something new to the 90s. Um, inequality always existed in Venezuela, despite some level of social mobility. Um, these community movements date back to the period of the 50s, the 60s, all the way through the so-called democratic era. Um, there were uh, um, community-based groups who were contesting that order, who were contesting the whole division of Venezuelan society into middle-class elite and, and poor Venezuelans. Um, and the, 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 the period of the 90s when that crystallizes and when you see a, a massive growth of barrio-based organizations demanding their um, groups, demanding their rights, um, is, is something that is rooted in all of those earlier movements, particularly from the 60s and 70s when you saw the influence of civil rights and black power among um, Afro-Venezuelan groups in, in places like the Barrio of San Agustin. Um, and you saw this sort of... Uh, um, uh, identity politics as well, based in music, based in culture. That is, that's all the sort of stuff that I look at in in my work. And uh, part of what you know was the impetus for my own research was living in the West and seeing. Um, I think that Nilo makes an important point about how do we get our information through? What lens are we able to understand what's happening in a country like Venezuela that is becoming more and more isolated and cut off because of the lack of an, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, proper media channels and reporting and our ability to know what's going on there. And, and I would also add that um, that that access to digital technology is also very class based. And so, for instance, the vast majority of people I worked with in social movements and activists, they don't have access to smartphones. So, um, you know, it's a lot harder to follow what they're doing on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and other social media because, um, you know, they have internet cafes and that's very popular in the barrios, but it's not as easy for them to just tweet whatever's happening on a smartphone. So for me, when I began this research in 2003, I was really interested to sort of, you know, I felt like living in the US, it was really hard to know what was going on on the ground. And um, and there were so many competing views. You had the people saying, this is a wonderful, glorious revolution. You had the people saying, this is a dictatorship and a, you know, a brutal regime. And you had such different points of view that I found that hard to pass out without actually um, going there and going and, and, and talking to people in the most vulnerable sectors of society. And so my research was based on, on living in one of those barrios for 10 months and, and talking to and, and living among and sort of hearing how things um, were from that point of view. And that's always shaped my lens, my lens of how I understand um, Venezuelan politics, my lens of how I understand, you know, the rise of Chavismo, the decline of Chavismo. Um, through um, through that angle and, and continues today to be the way that, you know, it's much more difficult because of how hard it is to get information, but continues to be the angle through which I'm trying to understand, you know, the changes that are happening here, happening there. So in terms of, you know, uh, giving that sort of uh, brief background, um, jumping forward to today, to the origins of the crisis and, um, and starting with Chavismo, um, I think that we, we, you know, uh, that these origins are multifaceted. The causes of, of, of where we've got to today are multifaceted. They're related both to the broader limitations of the Chavista project, but they're also related to the missteps of the Maduro government. And also, I would say, the aggressive actions and disruption by some sectors of the opposition. Um, so the first point um, I want to make is that, that uh, what was called Bolivarian Socialism, what was started in um, technically in 1998 by the Chavez government, but not, I mean, it really didn't get underway till early 2000s and more so after the, the failed coup attempt by the opposition when after which Chavez um, really embarked in, um, in much more uh, depth with the, with the project of, of what was called Bolivarian Socialism. Um, but th this was always carried out from in, within the machinery of a liberal state. This is not a Cuba where 
international capital was kicked out where um, the government and where um, you know uh, the the government basically took control of of, of companies and um, and capital that didn't happen in Venezuela and many people argue that um, that with from within this um, machinery of the liberal state it was much more difficult to effectively challenge um, the kind of glo unequal global order that Venezuela founded in by, found itself in by the late by the by the early 90s. Um, in addition to this, Venezuela has always been dependent on a model of exploitative resource extraction, um, export-oriented development, and a boom-bust cycle of fluctuating oil rents. Um, and so, the model of development that undergirded Chavismo is one that was one that was all, always highly dependent on oil rents is one that was unsustainable. And so most of the social programs that Chavez, uh, you know, sponsored from about 2003 onwards through the Misiones, the Mission um, uh, missions uh, to provide education, missions to provide uh, subsidized groceries, all of the services that in some ways were replacing what the welfare state had stripped away during the period of the 90s, um, were all based as they were in earlier epochs of Venezuelan history on um, oil rents. And, and of course, given that this is such a highly fluctuating commodity, when, um, when the, uh, the price of oil goes down, uh, those services become once more again vulnerable. And so this, I think, is, is one of the difficulties that Chavismo never really grappled with the fact that it was basing this whole program on re of redistribution, attempting to address deep-seated inequality in Venezuela, through um, through a commodity that was highly unstable. And of course, when um, um, in recent years, when the price of oil has, has collapsed, this is one of the big reasons why Venezuela, why these programs set up by the Chavez government have simply been gutted because there's been no, um, um, uh, nothing to take its place. Secondly, um, has been the economic policies of the Maduro government and other people, economists have written about this in detail. Um, for instance, the fixed exchange rate has led to a burgeoning black market. Um, and then as well as these, these economic problems, there have been issues of bureaucracy, widespread corruption, um, and, uh, and, and these are the kind of issues that we see discussed a lot in the um, Western media. So I'm not going to go into it here, but, um, but I, I would say that, yes, that's true, it is correct that these issues exist. Um, but I would also say, as Tori said um, uh, very well in her opening, that this is often what we're presented with. This is kind of the only scenario that we're presented with, and it's much more complicated than that. Um, and then thirdly, and I've, I've written about this and I've had friends who've been um, direct victims of this kind of economic warfare and sabotage by the opposition um, and terrorist actions by some sectors of the opposition. So, for instance, there's been hoarding and speculation by commercial interests which have deliberately created shortages. This has been a, a common aspect of the economic war. Um, and more recently, we've seen acts of domestic terrorism. So, for instance, um, there was a tear gas attack by some members of an opposition on a maternal child hospital in the poor barrio of El Valle. And El Valle was the place where I lived for 10 months when I was in Venezuela. And I think that all of these kind of terrorist attacks and these economic warfare sabotage are attempts, part of opposition attempts to create a climate of instability. So what is the, the current scenario? Um, the current scenario is that Venezuela confronts a very difficult moment, a one of conflict, one of economic hardship, um, the threat of possible sanctions and actual sanctions and unrest. Um, and the US government is very openly funding anti-Maduro forces. And, and this is just uh, giving even more fuel to the threat of an impending civil war or another possible coup like what we saw earlier. Um, there is also the danger of a shift to a right-wing fascist regime um, if some sectors of the opposition were to gain ascendancy. And I think this is something particularly that that there is a lot of fear of among the, the people that I worked with, the people in the barrios who um, who have lived through, um, uh, you know, the, the earlier coup and, and and seen what that could, um, what that situation could look like. We've seen it, for instance, in a country like Honduras. 
Um, so what what possible futures? This is something else that we're you know sort of being asked to reflect on. Um, there's a lot of talk of dialogue, and I think that dialogue is ab absolutely essential. That um, we need dialogue to bring about a short-term ceasefire, to try to, to 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 sort of put an end to the violence, to put an end to um, to this you know what is rapidly escalating into a scenario that could look like a civil war. Um, but I don't think that dialogue is necessarily going to address the underlying chasms in Venezuelan society. And like I said, um, that these chasms, this inequality between the rich and the poor, between the, the people in the barrios and between um, between those new, you know, elites who have sort of been, were empowered in the 1990s by neoliberal reforms. Um, I think that that is a much more uh, entrenched division in society that Chavismo attempted to address by redistributing income, by creating social policies that would redistribute income downwards. And like I said, I think that that partly failed because of the um, because of the dependence on oil. Um, but there needs to be a solution to that. We can't say simply, well, both sides can get together, resolve this, or that you know some sectors of the opposition come into power and this issue is going to go away. The issue came into being precisely, uh, well, I think part of this current scenario is due to those very deep divisions in Venezuelan society. And they're not simply political polarization created by Chavismo Maduro. They're actual real structural divisions in Venezuelan society. Um, my own uh, response at this moment is to take my lead from the grassroots barrio and rural social movements on the ground. And from what I know, many of them still offer a kind of critical support to the Maduro government, who see themselves as somewhat autonomous from the government, who see themselves as trying to um, to deepen their own work of independent organizing, but they, they are afraid of, uh, of supporting the opposition because they see the alternative. They see, for instance, the kind of situation that exists in a country like Mexico. They see what happened in Honduras after, Honduras after the coup. Um, and, and there is a kind of fear of Venezuela moving towards that kind of situation. And so for that reason, they continue to critically support the Maduro government as giving them the best opportunity to be able to continue their work of independent organizing, whether through cultural activism, worker cooperatives, communes, unions, the community-based media. Um, and 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 that's a lot. They have a long-term vision, a vision that would continue the redistributive, the work of redistributive justice, um, the work of community building, um, and also consciousness raising. All of these things that have been very much a part of recent years. Um, and my own hope is that Venezuela is able to reach some kind of stability that allows them to continue this important work. Thank you. So we promised you diverse perspectives, <laughs> diverse disciplinary perspectives, diverse conceptual perspectives, um, and I think that's what we've offered. I think the best job I can do right now is not to follow up with the thousands of questions that I wrote down, but instead to turn the microphone immediately over to you guys. <laughs> I would say we don't have a ton of time, so I would ask that you get to the question, you know, that you've always been to that talk where that one person has a long exegesis before they get to the question. I would request that we, <laughs> and I'll try not to do that myself right now, um, get to the question, ask it, um, so that we can get a lot, of, uh, a lot of ideas on the table and see what we do with this. So um, I think a microphone is gonna circle around the room, so please do, please do contribute. Okay, I am Sylvia Pedraza, professor of sociology and American culture. And actually, I'm working on a book that I am almost finished with that compares the Cuban Revolution and the Venezuelan revolutions. And for that, I have a Venezuelan co-author because I wouldn't dare <laughs> do the Venezuelan part all by myself. Uh, and that's Carlos Antonio Romero that, you know, Dan knows well and thinks very highly of. Um, you know, just beginning with uh, Nilo, um, 
I actually think that Univision has done a very good job, though, of keeping us abreast of what's happening in, in Venezuela. I'd say that five out of seven days in a week, they would have something on Venezuela, except, of course, recently the hurricanes and so on, you know, meant that, it, uh, and Las Vegas, it has dropped out, but I would expect that it would come back. But I think, you know, what I see, and it, you know, in the, in the media is enormous protests on the part of the people that keep growing, keep getting more violent. You know, there truly is no way to know which way this is going to end. But at the same time, and I think this is a comment for Dan also, I don't see the Venezuelan opposition making a clear statement as to exactly what they want. Um, and I did notice that none of you actually talked very much about the nature of the opposition. And that, you know, that, that's a question, I guess, for me. And the lack of clarity as to the message. I mean, I, uh, Dan has been far clearer than the opposition in Venezuela is. <laughs> I see a couple of hands. Maybe we'll take three questions at a time and then have people answer them because it looks like you might even be piggybacking off of this. Let's take yeah, one and then over here will be number three. And I also have a, a question that was passed to me at the front, so we'll, we'll throw in four if that's okay and we'll let the panelists answer them. Thanks. Um, this is a question for Dr. Fernandez. Um, I thought it was interesting how you talked about the perspective from the Barrios, but um, I was wondering if I'm right in understanding that it's a very small section of Venezuela that still supports Maduro. And I was also wondering, when you talk about the redistribu redistribution work they are continuing to do, I was wondering, what is that redistribution work? Because I know that 80 to 90 percent of Venezuelans s report that they are struggling to find enough food every day. And so I wonder, like, do you mean that now everyone is struggling to find food? Like, I don't understand what the redistribution that has happened is. Um, so my name is Alan Martel. I am a PhD student at the School of Information. Um, I would like to ask a question uh, to whomever in the panel would like to, to, to help me here, basically echoing the first question related to the nature, the, the, the heterogeneous nature of the opposition. Uh, as somebody who comes from, from, uh, from a country in Latin America, El Salvador, uh, I am one among many in Latin America who basically learn about Venezuela as a cautionary tale about the dangers of the of the com of communism and particularly socialism of the 21st century. And so, from one side, you will see uh, the opposition depicted as somehow unified and basically trying to oust the government, whereas on the other side of the spectrum, you would see the claims that the opposition is very completely divided, lacking leaders, uh, and in fact, fa fascist. So. Uh, ha, what what do we make out of this? Who is the opposition? And if I can add one fourth question that was passed to me, um, one member of the of the room would like to know how Venezuela is being rated by human rights groups today. So what are the kind of um, external agencies? Con how are they considering what's happening in Venezuela? So maybe uh, let the panelists go. Perhaps maybe in the same order of presentation. Would that make sense? And you can answer any aspect of any of the questions as you would as you would see fit. Okay. That means I must go first. Yes. Is that okay? <laughs> I could let you decide. I don't care. That's <laughs> fine. Um, well, um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Nilo and Sujata. It was very interesting. I particularly like the graphics. Uh, they were very fascinating. And uh, the use of social media, we know, all of us know, is ballooned in these kinds of events. The model of organizing a protest movement by building a political party with branches everywhere that uh, the 19th century model just doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's one of the reasons Venezuelan parties sort of collapsed. People just didn't like that anymore. It's too constricting. Um, I think it's false to talk about, or how can I say this? I think that, um, let's talk about the opposition first. The opposition is a, is a coalition. Obviously, it was very difficult for them to become a coalition. It required a great deal of negotiation. They've got everybody from old line politicians to new people. Uh, it's a precarious coalition. Uh, one of the reasons their leadership is uh, a little difficult is they get arrested a lot and go incommunicado. So I think it's a bit of an unfair uh, criticism. But it is a coalition. And uh, I, I don't know if I would like to be a fly on the wall in their discussions about what they should do. But I think they are united. Uh, I think it's true that that their main focus is we don't want what we have, right? We want something else. And the promise is that the promise is that something else will be better than the current situation. 
if the current situation is one of what Sujata said was this work of redistributive justice, and that ends up with an exponential increase in poverty, loss of weight by most Venezuelans, a drop in real income, scarcity of basic goods, that isn't much of redistributive justice as far as I am concerned. I also think that it is an exaggeration to paint the picture as one of incipient civil war. There's absolutely no evidence for that. There are moments of violence. There's no, there are. But the bulk of this violence, as far as I'm concerned, is official violence exercised. Uh, there's a lot of violence. There's no question about that. One of the best books that I've read recently about Venezuela is a book called Barrio Rising by Alejandro Velasco, which is a study of the 23rd of January barrio in, in Caracas. It's a great social history of the barrio, and one of the points that he emphasizes is violence. I think he underplays the violence that comes out of the barrio. There's, Suhata is right. There's a lot of uh, social movements that predate Chavez that were uh, strongly linked to what was a failed leftist insurrection in the 60s. Um, but um, I think it's, it's an exaggeration to think that this is close to civil war and that we have to call a truce. I, I think that's not true. And um, the last point I would make is about inequality in Venezuela. Venezuela is notoriously unequal. Almost, there's no question about that. It has been for a long time. Um, but the notion that its inequality became a great deal worse because of the 90s, it's become a great deal worse in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, it's become a great deal worse consistently, and it's a problem of this particular sort of economy. The, no the problem with Venezuela is they don't really have an alternative to relying on export growth to pay for things. This is a country. Um, where everything is imported. It's worse than it used to be, in fact, because local production capacity has been decimated. In agriculture, cars aren't, I mean, you name it, they're not doing it, right? And um, so therefore, if everything's imported, you, you can't import, nobody wants Bolivar is, my God, you must be crazy, right? But you have to import in some kind of internationally recognized currency, and the price of petroleum, as we all know, is now about a third to a half of what it was 10 years ago. But and the last thing I'll say, uh, the, the, it is also true that the economic crisis in Venezuela predates the drop in the price of petroleum. It is not all due to the drop in the price of petroleum. And Sujatha recognized the, the rigid exchange rates, but there's also been massive attacks on the productive capacity of the country. Attacks on the media also include physical attacks on newspaper offices, on reporters, um, so the economic, these crises predate the collapse of petroleum, although the collapse of petroleum makes it worse. There's not much question about that. Um, so I, I think I covered the three things I wanted to. I really appreciated the stuff on the new social media outlets. That was very interesting. I think that's absolutely so. Um, and I don't think Venezuela just found itself with a more unequal global order in the 90s. It's always been in an unequal global order. Uh, the question is, how do you make your way in that? And uh, you have to export the petroleum. They're sitting on the biggest pool of petroleum resources in the world. Uh, I'll close with one story. Somebody years ago in Venezuela said to me, uh, the question um, that terrified generations of school children in the 1960s is, why did Napoleon, the greatest general in the history of the world, invade Russia and go in with half a million men and come out with a few hundred? And now what terrifies Venezuelans is how did the country with these huge fiscal resources end up with the biggest foreign debt in history? How is that possible? And the answer is, it's bad management. Let's be, let's be serious, right? Uh, it, it was, some of that was used, the big boom was used to finance things, that's right. But uh, it was also used in a kind of a not a very wise way. So that's my response. Um, I'm, I, I, I'll respond to some of the questions about, uh, I, I, I mean, Sida's uh, question in particular. I mean, I think Univision is an interesting case because Univision um, is intimately related to the Cisneros, who were the owners of RCTV before selling it to NBC Universal. So I acknowledge that, um, you know, that Univision, in addition to other kinds of Spanish language media outlets in the States, have become a really useful, a really handy way of, uh, of keeping tabs or at least being informed about Venezuela. Um, but I also acknowledge that it's intimately related to an old guard, right, and to 
corporate interests in, a, in, a, in an interesting, I mean, the US, it's strange because we think about as we, we, I've said, oh, we have hundreds of channels and yet we've never had fewer owners of, 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 of you know, media platforms and network properties. So, um, Univision is kind of a, it's, it's a, it, um, I, again, I acknowledge that it's, it's, it's one of the main ways we get out, we get news, at least in a conventional matter, you know, both through print, online, and TV journalism, but it's very much, at least in the States, implicated with the Cisneros and with corporate interest in the U.S. Um, I do think that this question about what the opposition narrative is, uh, why the opposition hasn't come out with a, a firm narrative, is intimately related to the splintered media landscape. I, I, as, as, as Daniel was saying, like uh, the 19th century way of thinking about parties, the 20th century way of thinking about mass politics, doesn't necessarily work. And I do think that, to a degree, one has to think about it hand in hand with the ways that uh, people come together, people get information, and people um, uh, try to operate change. Where change happens is, is different now. Um, so I don't want to necessarily make a deterministic argument, but I think that that's partly what is, that, that's, that's what I think is one of the reasons why it's hard to necessarily say, well, why hasn't the opposition come out and just said, or why don't they just you know, do X, Y, and Z? Um, I do take uh, Sujata's point about um, there is a digital divide. I mean, this inequality also uh, has to be thought in terms of media practices and access to internet, access to phones. Okay, so uh, yeah, oh, this one works really well. Uh, okay. So, I'll be, although will there be feedback? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, see, uh, yeah, and so I, I acknowledge that, you know, so it's not like Brazil where there are 200 million WhatsApp users in Brazil. You know, it's, it's, it's not like that. I, I, I lived in Brazil when they shut down, they had an injunction to shut down WhatsApp and the country was paralyzed. Like, it's not, it's not that. So, um, it, you know, I, th I think uh, there, uh, it's uh, something to the effect, I mean, to get like this is a really it was a silly way of thinking about the digital vibe, but something like uh, only about less than ten percent of phones are LTE, you know. So j just to give a sense of not how backward, but how this how access to this kind of of stuff is uh, is something that sh should be thought about. And I do I also take the point of um, the deep mistrust of opposition of of, of the of the possibilities of the opposition that uh, Sujata was mentioning. I think that that's a, a, a a, a, a genuine concern that the opposition hasn't necessarily been able to address. Although um, one could, I guess, uh, the, it's difficult. Be, yeah, I, I, I keep on saying like it's difficult to address, and I think that we forget that difficult that 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 addressing is important. Like how to address. Uh, uh, we forget that to address you need things to address with, and that is something that we don't necessarily have in this context. Uh, uh, in the same ways that we that you know that we used to in last in a in the in the well, fifty years ago, um, so yeah, that that's all I have to say. Uh, Neil is trying to pass the mic to you, Sujata, but I don't think you need it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so uh, just to address the question about um, you know the, the the is it just a small sector? Um, maybe it could face the audience if that's possible. The camera. Um, oh, oh, that's perfect. Yes. No, but the, the kind of Sorry, I mean my my view. Thank you. Thanks. Empty chair. Uh, perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so to the question about, um, you know, is it is it a, just a small sector now that supports Maduro? And I think, yes, it is just a small sector. If we're talking about the kind of rah-rah, you know, uh, um, cheerleading kind of support that we saw for Chavez when he was in office, um, it is, yes, it is it is quite a small, a small section. But we also have to think that... Um, in the Chavez era, when, when Hugo Chavez was in power, there were very deep networks of organized movements across the whole country, some of them generated by Chavismo, some of them generated from below. Um, and, and those movements were the ones that powered Chavismo on through 
all the various elections, through the recall referendum, through many um, of the events of those years of Chavismo, the, 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 a lot of the support for the government was coming from these deep networks of organizing movements. And we have to ask, where are those movements today? What do they think? What do they see of this, of this current scenario? And I would say, for them, what is foremost is still their project of liberation, their project of social justice above foremost, right? And whether or not they see Maduro as somebody who can carry that out, they clearly saw Chavez as somebody who, and again, not with, with you know, full un, um, uh, support, but with a kind of critical support, uh, where do they see themselves now? I don't think that those deep networks of organized movements who still exist today and who are still doing their work I don't think they see, for instance, the opposition leaders as somebody who is going to help them push those movements forward. I don't know that they see Maduro necessarily as somebody who is going to do that, but um, they have not come out in a sort of condemnation of Maduro. A lot of those, the leaders of those, and I'm talking about all the sort of big networks of community media organizations, of, um, of the Afro-Venezuelan Afro movement, of a lot of these organizations who worked in coalition, the indigenous movements, worked in coalition during the Chavez era. Right now, I think they find themselves in a difficult position, but I don't think that um, that they've come out you know, against the government in the way that, that opposition sectors have. Um, and then secondly, you asked a question about redistribution and what's happening, and the point that I made earlier was while, yes, um, uh, you know, uh, from the period of about 2003 to, um, to maybe five, six years ago, or, you know, um, until the collapse of oil prices, um, that, 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 we, that there was a very strong um, redistribution. What I said was that with the collapse of oil prices, with all of the economic difficulties of the country, yeah, that has halted. It's much more difficult now um, for those programs to exist and to be funded. So, no, there is not much but but yet what i was saying was that that is the vision of many of the social movements that i know that vision of redistributive justice is one that they continue to hold on to and one that they continue to believe in so i've been holding my tongue i'm dying to ask them a question but i also want to make sure that i give all of you one more chance we only have about five minutes left is there anyone with a burning desire to pose a question <laughs> to one of these esteemed panels yes a burning desire right here in the yellow shirt yeah. i would not silence that Thank you. So uh, for you, Professor, so I know you said you don't know what's going to happen, but if you had to give it your best shot, if you had to guess, how long do you think this is going to last? When will the Socialist Party, if not Maduro, but the Socialist Party be out of power? What do you think will happen or when will it happen, if you had to guess? And, and was there another hand that I saw? So I, I, um, can, can you hold up one second? Oh, you want to take them all? Might as well put them all on the table. We're going to put them all on the table and see what you can do in five minutes. Um, my, in, in the three presentations, I only heard one statement about drug trafficking. Wow. Yet, it, many of the learned people that I read state that this is the second largest export, coming close to the first largest export of, of Venezuela. How much of that is keeping this regime in power, do you believe? I can offer you my own quick view on both questions. As for how long this will last, I don't know. Uh, I don't think anybody who says they know really knows. But if it lasts a while, I would assume a good couple of years at least, and I think the, the future is likely more of the same. Uh, it's a curious government which considers that the solution to economic problems is more controls. Economic prob controls are one of the problems in supply and distribution, and the control of supply has been used as a, as a political tool. It is the military that controls supply of foods and medicines and a great many. The military is the unseen or almost seen but not really recognized power here in my own view. Uh, uh, that gets us into the question of the drug trafficking because I'm no expert on drug trafficking. What little I read uh, suggests to me that Venezuela is a through point, right? There's a lot of transshipment. And some of the forces in the Venezuelan government, not all, but some, like the, like the National Guard, have a notorious history of corruption. I mean, uh, you know, uh, in Spanish, the joke about the National Guard always was the slogan on their sleeves said, el honor es su divisa, honor is its uniform. But the joke, everyone said, was el honor ni se divisa, you can't see honor at all. 
And I think there's been a lot of accusations of corruption, just like I don't know, I haven't seen the reports. There's a lot of accusations which are hotly contested that Chavez, when he was in power, was supplying arm armaments to the FARC in Colombia and uh, providing safe zones. I believe those accusations. I think they're true. I mean, they're, they, he was clearly sympathetic with them. And so it's in a network there, uh, um, which has been going on for a while. So I didn't mention it, no. While we're at it, I'll add one last comment. Just, it won't take more than 30 seconds. I really reject the description of Venezuelan democracy in the 60s and 70s as a so-called democracy. I think what we have now is a so-called democracy. Venezuelan democracy was a freely elected set of governments. It had a lot of problems. It collapsed for good reasons. It had corruption problems, and it had mismanagement problems, and it had a huge economic crisis. But it was not a so-called democracy. Um, it's, that's one of those tropes which has gotten into conversation, like people talk about the coup in Brazil removing Gilma Rousseff. I didn't think removing Gilma was a very good idea, but it was a fully constitutional process, unlike the current government of Venezuela, which has just destroyed its constitution. So I really stand on one side of these issues. Uh, so might as well say it since I'm retired. Nobody can do anything to me. <laughs> um, Professor Fernandez and Professor Cote, is there anything that we didn't address that you think needs to be said before we, before we wrap up? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess what I would say is as we think about, you know, by the nature of the conversation, we've been thinking about this within the confines of the nation state of Venezuela and its own kind of national history and where these things come from. But I think where the conversation has brought us is to come back to thinking of it in the international sphere and to thinking about the growth of inequality globally, um, particularly after the neoliberal reforms of the 1990s, what that has meant in multiple places, how drug trafficking is, you know, complicit with a, a transnational trade that, Im that you know, is, is centered here in the United States what these things look like, and also keep thinking about the, the places in which real efforts to address inequality through redistributive justice have been meeting these kinds of ends. And I actually would find more parallels with the Brazilian case to Venezuela than what you do, but maybe we could talk about that at dinner. Um, and so we might want to just kind of pull back the lens a little as we think about this and say, what does this mean for the future of social justice and redistributive efforts? What, where can we go with this? Um, but I want to really thank all the panelists, especially those who are, have not even had coffee um, at 7 o'clock in the morning. Thank all of you guys for coming, for all of your questions and your comments. And um, let's give them a round of applause, please.